Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 442. That's 442, double four two. How you doing? How you feeling? What's going on? Great, amazing, good to hear. If it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below with all your thoughts, feelings, and suggestions. If you're listening via the podcast app, of course, a five-star review would go a long way in helping spread the show and getting it out there to the masses. And of course, support via Patreon to access my bonus episodes, which get two per week. To access those, just join the Patreon for little as one dollar per month, and you get access to two bonus episodes per week recorded and delivered only for my Patreon subscribers. If you want to get a little bit deep into some other topics you know maybe speak on some more taboo things then definitely get involved and get involved over there on that side what are you waiting for get involved there today so how's it going how are you hope you're well wherever you may be um you know on this fateful day that you hear my soothing voice coming at you live and direct what's been happening lately nothing much really uh, we've marked the morbid um, year anniversary since we've been in lockdown here in the uk we're probably the same wherever you may be which is you know not the best thing to celebrate it's not you know it's not a it's not a birthday right it's not an anniversary of any it's not like a good anniversary of any sorts it's one of those sort of morbid things that you probably don't want to remember again um pretty much i guess it's akin a little bit to what happened with the twin towers you remember when that tragedy happened right in 9 11 there were a few really big large scale sort of memorials sort of done to kind of you know remember the ones that were unfortunately passed away during that fateful day and then sooner well as time went by i'd imagine the family was just like you know what we just want to do our own little private things i'd imagine doing stuff on this sort of scale replaying your grief to the public it's just too much and i guess with this because it's just been so obviously it's grief stricken because i'm sure people have lost you know valuable members of their family friends and whatever colleagues but overall it's been so um it's been so dull right it's been so glamorous it just feels gray the last thing you want to do is be reminded of some horrendous boring gray outfit you wore on a night out one day you kind of just want to catalog it back into the you know recess of your mind but you know we have to remember these things and mark them down as some sort of thing and hopefully the key thing that we want going forward is that we don't repeat the same mistakes so we try not to do whatever we did now and um, that led us in this position which it probably wasn't our fault for the most especially uk wise we didn't have any sort of say in this the press aren't really you know pushing the politicians in any meaningful way which has been really disappointing if i have to be honest watching some of the press conferences and seeing how easy and lightly um the journalists tread around the politicians when they're meant to be grilling them and asking them questions and holding them to account instead all you have is this weird exchange where for the most part they're just trying to catch them out they're trying to do those really weird gotcha moments right they're trying to make sure this person slips up and says something they're not meant to say or misspeaks or whatever it may be but there's nothing in terms of being the voice for the public because for the most part the public doesn't give a shit that somebody you turn on this or whatever they don't really care if anything we want to know can these people be held to account for the stuff that they said themselves right so if it's like oh if we reach a certain amount of numbers we're going to open this part of the economy back up again cool well we're here now what's going to happen that doesn't get asked instead it's just you know nonsense after nonsense after nonsense after nonsense i'm just happy that they've stopped being those reports of politicians breaking lockdown rules remember that was like a thing that was happening like every other week somebody was getting pulled for saying one thing and then doing the other i'm just glad that's currently over because the journalists just you know they were obsessed with finding people that were hypocrites when we're all hypocrites right we're all do this i think you know as much as we want to judge these people i'm sure if we we're in a position that they were where you basically have carte blanche to do exactly what you want and you never get reprimanded that's that's the interesting part of it right journalists politicians they never actually face any consequence to the errors of their work nothing like a journalist could like you know like a taylor lorenz can go out there and try and find the smoking gun right try and find the clip of you saying something really bad in the chat room or something to get you to lose your job 
but then when it's kind of discovered that she was you know essentially lying or she didn't research her story properly and put out an incorrect a uh, bit of information that could have cost you your job doesn't apologize and her job doesn't come into question same codes of politicians they can say what they want never deliver on their promises and nothing really happens to them apart from you know maybe facing the consequences of what they've done when it comes to election right it's just such a so i guess maybe that's why they're like a marriage made in heaven they kind of serve each other in that respect and the politicians and journalists in that regard and unfortunately us as regular civilians um, we're the ones that have to sort of bear the brunt of it. We're the ones that have to kind of um, bear the consequences of the fact that we're just being led very, very slowly down this reopening phase and things seem to be getting better. Numbers seem to be going where they should be going and you no know, down, cases are going down, deaths are going down, but there's really no real speeding up of the process. It's still the same methodical approach and who knows, maybe in general this makes sense, you know? that we, we we really didn't do well in the beginning of this whole thing i can't complain really because summer of last year was a complete mess and then heading into the winter was even worse and then the whole debacle with giving us a five-day break during christmas was just you know something that you, you don't really want to think about you want to throw yourself out the window out of four of that being an actual suggestion um so the fact that we're even in this position at the moment where we've kind of got vaccines you know in the we've got vaccines out there that are doing good um, we're developing other ones uh, we're ramping through all the really at-risk groups of people and we're getting everybody vaccinated in you know in record numbers we're probably doing much better than a lot of people would have thought this time last year so we have to basically take what we're given in that respect but it would be nice to see a little bit more combativeness when it came to sort of echoing the thoughts and opinions of people that are just working people that are you know trying to keep a roof over their heads as opposed to these weird sparring gotcha moments between journalists and politicians because we don't really care about that sort of stuff we don't i'd imagine i speak i don't speak for everybody but i'd imagine most people want to find out why exactly we're still in this position when things are obviously getting better why can't the goalposts or why can't the targets or why can't the reopening dates be changed a little bit even a couple of days even a week would really boost everyone's morale but you know maybe these things are set in stone for a reason because there's a grander plan who knows who bloody knows so jam-packed show for you today loads of stuff to get involved in so make sure you grab yourself a little drink and a snack whatever it is that you want to nibble on and sip on and let's dive on deep so first things first to get involved in first things first um news that i'm currently not that pleased with not that surprised by and probably should just find a way of dealing with because this is going to be my reality for a very very long time and that is the news of Oli Gunnar Solskjaer agreeing a new 30 million pound united contract right 30 million for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer supreme coaching ability um and trophy winning edge right it's insane but so this is from the mirror it says Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was due to be out of contract end of the season and my United, but Ed Woodward has sanctioned the new uh has sanctioned the new contract despite the Norwegian not winning a trophy yet this is from a journalist called David McDonnell it says Ole Gunnar Solskjaer will be handed a 30 million dollar a 30 million pound deal by Manchester United even if he fails to win a trophy this season United are in the quarterfinals of Europa League and favorites to win it but Solskjaer's future is not dependent on lifting the trophy the Old Trafford hierarchy, hierarchy, heresy, hierarchy, led by executive chairman Ed Woodward, are convinced United remain on the right path under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Solskjaer, 48, who has one year left in his contract, is said to be awarded the new three-year contract, likely to be two years plus an option for an extra. Now, I don't necessarily have an issue with him receiving the contract. We need just isolate it in terms of the job that he's done currently cool right um we're top four we're probably going to finish the top four most likely most likely we haven't won a trophy yet but we still got a chance of winning one in the europa league um he's improved a couple of players in the squad i'd say luke shaw's been given a bit more of confidence uh i would say it's a combination of luke shaw luke shaw's a weird one because he spent what best part of is it five seasons or something stinking up the place playing terribly He's been dropped. He's probably been, if you think about it, Luke Shaw might be the one player in United who has been dropped most of the starting lineup. 
maybe in Martial, but there's not a few, there's not a lot of them who get dropped consistently. Martial only had Lukaku and Ibrahimovic, isn't it? Yeah, Shaw's been dropped by a few people. He's been dropped by Valencia. No, Valen He's been dropped by Ashley Young, Brandon Williams, Timothy Fosu Mensa for a little bit. Um, that's free, isn't it? So yeah, so no, but anyway, in that space of time, his, his position's always been in question. And he's never really pulled up any trees, wasn't called out for England. So, you know, it's a great it's a good indication that he's not playing level that he's meant to play. So his current form at the moment can be attributed to obviously only going to social point out right in shoulder and saying, Hey, I back you, play your game, do your thing. But it could also be a large part due to the fact that we brought in Alex Tellers from Porter, who is the former Porto captain. He's twenty eight years old, Brazilian international. So he's coming in expecting to start games. He's not coming in just to warm uh, bench to uh, warm the bench. That pushed him in training, I think, week in, week out, seeing a, a defender of that level, of that quality playing and really putting pressure on him because he can't play any other position, right? I think if you're Luke Shaw, even if you do get a job by Brandon Williams, he's a kid, you know he's going to have a blip, you know, two and three first with mental, all these other people, you know they're going to have blips and they're not going to keep performing at that level, but with a senior member behind you, it does make put the pressure on you to perform because if you do have a blip and they have a good game, it's very likely that the manager will stick with that player. So he improved Luke Shaw. Um, maybe he gave Dean Henderson some confidence. I'm not really sure about that either. Uh, you can maybe say Dan James, not really either. I, don't, I wouldn't say, especially not this season. But in general, he's been a net positive to the overall squad in terms of morale, in terms of how they approach playing football in terms of their feelings about being at United, right? He's a marked difference with Mourinho. But in terms of our ability to, you know, retain re or regain, uh, regain the league title and be able to win domestic trophies and European trophies, do we really see any anything that tells us social is a guy in that respect? Not really. Um, the football that we play, I, I've always kind of said, we probably have the worst style of football, I think, of the top six sides, hands down definitely um it's not really fun to watch us play especially if the opponents don't allow us to counter attack it doesn't really make for compelling viewing and that kind of style of play doesn't really work in most big high caliber games because it's tight and the oppos opposing side blocks out all the spaces limits your and basically sometimes limits your time on the ball especially in the, in the places that matter in the final third in the final third in the final third so there are a lot of things that concerning our style of play that i'm a little bit dubious about when it comes to giving Oligon social that contract and then on top of that He's just not in demand manager. So there should be no rush to give him the contract now without any trophies and without the guarantee that we're going to finish top four. Now, it will be a catastrophe for us to drop out of the top four. And it's also not unlikely that we're not going to finish with a trophy. So if that's the case, it really makes you think, what's the contract all about? Is it just another sign that United have accepted that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is more often than not going to get you top four football, but he's not going to win you trophies, which they want. It's essentially, they've shown us this, right? Every manager has been sacked so far, got sacked because they didn't get top four football, not because they didn't win trophies. So we're now turning into Arsenal. And, <laughs> and there's no real pressure or anything on the manager to win a trophy, which kind of has been obvious from Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's previous comments where he said trophies are for egos. So if trophies are for egos... Why give him a contract? Why extend it? There's no rush, especially now. Why not just wait until the end of the season? And then you could go from there. But, you know, it continues here. It says, under the terms, a new deal. Solskjaer is likely to have his salary. Let's pause this. I use all the play videos. Have his salary rise from 7.5 million to 10 million a year. Again, really cheap considering the level of manager, the level of team that he is managing, his profile and stuff. So that is another maybe example of why he's hired in that regard, why he's being you know given an extension. He's just a really cheap option. To reflect the progress made under him since being put in the permanent charge almost two years ago to the day. United do not want the destruction of social into the final year of his contract with his future unresolved so the new deal is likely to be confirmed at the end of this season <sighs> although social could end um his second full season in charge without winning anything united are currently 12 points better off than they were at this stage last season and of course uh, on course to finish second there is belief that the club is progress is made under social since taking over from Mourinho in 2018 has confirmed this term which the club is betting to make an incredible title this challenge next season I don't necessarily see how that's logical to be honest um Liverpool we're kind of it's a bit of a false I won't say a false position but it's a little bit of a we're probably reading too much into our position 
I would still say we probably have, in terms of starting lineups, we might have the second best starting lineup in the league, maybe third behind Liverpool, in terms of like how it operates, how the threats on the pitch, the goal threats, the defensive solidity, all that malarkey. But a lot of this, the position that we're in at the moment is maybe largely in part due to the fact that Liverpool have imploded, right? Probably one of the worst title defences we've ever seen in Premier League history. Um, which essentially takes them out of the top four conversation. So that frees a position that we've kind of filled in by proxy. And we also have the best players out of that top four currently at the moment playing. You know, obviously Chelsea had to had to change a manager. Arsenal are going through what Arsenal's going through. Man City have obviously got the best manager in the league in Pep Guardiola and unlimited resources. So the position that we're in is sort of the position that we should be in. We should either be second or third. It's not really an achievement in in the way that they're saying it is. Obviously, you have to do it still. And then um, there's still that added caveat of the season isn't over. We should really compare points um, of the season of the season we finished on. Well, yes, we we should really compare the points we finished this season on compared to last, the regards of position. So if we finish second, but we have a lower point tally than what we did last season, it's another illustration that we haven't really improved. We just kind of just stayed where we are, and that's not really good enough, right, for this level of football that we this level of football that we're playing at. And also considering the fact that our rivals are all going to improve in the summer. Liverpool are going to reinvest. Um, Chelsea are going to reinvest more, especially under Tuchel. He's obviously proved that that um, way of buying players has worked very well for them so far. The players that were bought were are all pretty good, except for maybe Werner, who's maybe flat to deceive, and maybe Kai Havertz to a certain extent. But they all look like great players, especially when they played in a, in a correct system. Mourinho is probably going to get more funds, you would assume. Everyone around us, Leicester, are obviously um, doing great stuff. They even beat up, they knocked us out of the FA Cup pretty soundly. So it, this only works if everybody stays still like us, but no one's going to stand still in that regard. So if that's the case and we don't have the money to really improve the team the way we want to see it, because, you know, they talk a big game about spending power, but in general, the transfers that we make and the, the positions that need filling can't don't really marry up last season's a good example we probably still needed five subs five transfers we didn't get five um we didn't get a position that we need to fill and in the end it ended up costing us in terms of really sustaining a proper title challenge so if we're a team that's okay we're finishing top four but we don't we don't have enough money to spend and social as a manager who everyone says needs money it seems like an odd marriage in that respect you would probably be better off going out and getting a manager who could coach the players into playing a very efficient way of playing football with what he has available and then maybe sprinkling it in with a couple of signings here or there but if you really think you know if you're a United fan and you think we're going to go sign you know Haaland and Sancho and Grealish and all these players all in one summer window you are smoking some good stuff we're not going to do that. We're probably going to get one marquee signing, if that. And that's also depending on who leaves. You know, Pogba leaves, whatever it may happen. Um, that's when it's going to change. But in terms of at the moment, it seems like a very odd um, decision to make, especially at this stage, this stage of the season. But I also kind of understand it, considering the work he's done overall. Um, he really has kind of lifted the dark cloud that existed over United during Mourinho's tenure. It was a really negative um, time at the club. I didn't really enjoy watching us play. A lot of our fans hated our own players there was a lot of stuff to not really enjoy about the team and the club overall but now things are looking a bit brighter the director of football appointment i'm not really a fan of they just basically move people around inside the club gave people new job position titles but they're still reporting to ed woodward soul shark still has too much influence in transfers i think for a club of our size we should maybe be moving directly to the model of a sports director who goes out and sort of like specs out the entire vision of how the club wants to play football what kind of player profile they want to attract and then you fill in the manager to coach those players but this idea that we should have another manager signing his players that we when we sack him we have to get another manager who's going to sign his own play it just kept, it's a round round robin right it just it's a cyclical thing it doesn't stop so you'd want that to change so that's a bit of flat uh, flat as to deceive darren fletcher again a technical assistant job whatever he's got it doesn't make any sense he's not the best in class never is the john murto guy it really does kind of it really is a bit of an anti-climax in that regard nicky butt leaving which you know, people are saying that's because he didn't get the job himself there's a lot of things that are just affecting my overall hope that this appointment is actually a good thing going forward 
Um, again, like I said, he deserves it for the work he's done. But I still think for the club of our stature, we should be a bit more ruthless and be like, hey, great job, shake hands and keep it moving and get someone else in. If we really want to win the league, if we really want to win Champions League. But we don't. We kind of just want to finish top four and maybe win a trophy. And, you know, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer said, so, said as much. So I guess I just have to sit there and enjoy the ride. Sit there and enjoy the ride. Um, what else is next on here? Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, we got this. This is pretty interesting news. So, this is courtesy of um, this is courtesy of Complex. It said Joe Biden addresses Rory and Moles' absence from the Joe Biden podcast. So, obviously, some of you are aware that I'm a big fan of the Joe Biden podcast. Um, I've been listening to it since its inception when it was originally called Our Name is Podcast Later probably one of the greatest names for a podcast that ever existed um unfortunately you know over time they changed the name um i long suspect i long um suspected that that changing of the name might have made a few people in the team feel a little bit away calling it a job on the podcast was a little bit you know um a little bit misleading considering the show was less about joe and more about the friends that surround him no one really had any idea the kind of people he hangs around his persona online and on kind of loving hip-hop shows made you think like who would be friends with this guy because you know he's a little bit of an annoying dude then you meet the cast of characters that he surrounds himself with they all work in the industry they got great stories to tell that was what the show was more about so to name it just after that one person seemed a bit odd at the time but again from a branding and seo point of view it makes it easy to find it makes it easy to brand it's remember whatever it may be it's easy to say all this sort of stuff it makes sense that way um, then of course they went through an entire journey doing that show they signed up with spotify or one of the first sort of like indie sh podcasts to sort of jump over there when, po when podcasts were kind of having another moment i don't know third fourth sixth wave whatever it was um and then through th through the spotify deal it sort of opened up floodgates or opened up the you know the lens of what you could do with a show like that it got people interested um that sort of ramped up a little bit and then towards the end of their whatever tenure it was i'm not sure it was three or two year wherever that contract was there was obviously rumblings on the show that they weren't really happy with the contract negotiations that they were going on and eventually it deteriorated to the point where they decided to step away from, from spotify and just do it on their own and now they've essentially just doing it on their own with the patreon of course on top of it which they've just done recently adding in some bonus shows and clips and whatever it may be and of course in lieu of that he also learned the drip on he also launched the joe button podcast the joe button network sorry which encapsulates the two female-led podcasts i forgot the names of them um and maybe a few other things going on right so the idea i guess would be to kind of show proof of concept um show that you can still come under numbers that it wasn't a fluke show it consistently across a whole bevy of shows offer brands and whatever chance to line up and to kind of talk to certain audiences based on what the shows are doing and then eventually sell or license your, your network to a distributor of podcasting whatever they may be uh, for a higher figure and then go from there that i guess would be the plan but obviously hasn't necessarily worked out that way things have changed we're living in covid uh music industry whatever blah 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 podcasting has changed and the, uh, but the one thing i think that really affected this whole thing was the joe rogan experience moving to spotify when i listened to the show and it was kind of, set, you know, especially if you keep your ear to the ground, you would have known that obviously the Rogan deal was reported to be $100 million. But according to people in the know, everyone says it was a lot higher than that for a three year licensing deal where he's not giving them the show. He, they're just licensing it off him to put on Spotify like a crazy good deal. Right. And um, it was reported in, you know, behind the scenes that it was way more than the reported $100 million that he's meant to be getting. And when that happened, it happened around the same time that the contract negotiation with Joe Biden podcast was also deteriorating. So it made sense when Joe heard that being a narcissist and the overinflated ego that he has, he would get really hung up on it. And I think from then, the from then on, basically, the show was on a bit of a downward spiral, it felt like. It felt like, the, the, you know, he's obviously he's too... Uh, main co-host and Rory Amal was scratching their head thinking maybe we should have took the deal that Spotify gave them that was originally a rumor to be 30 million um, and then of course with COVID it stopped a lot of the stuff that they do themselves you know 
on, on the side of the show in terms of a and and moving around and doing live shows or whatever it may be it's never really been the same ever since then i think that is what kind of set things off and then of course recently um they've kind of been absent from the show for what maybe two episodes now so it's basically been a week or so they've been absent for the show and they kind of semi on strike and joe kind of finally addressed it on his show um recently and we'll read the article here it says joe Biden addresses rory and mo's absence from the joe Biden podcast it says as following when joe Biden i am the joe Biden, sorry when joe Biden's um co-host Rory and Ma were missing from the Saturday's episodes. Fans sparked a host of conspiracy theories. Um, this forced Budden and his um, other co-host Parks to reveal the real reason Ma Rory absent. Around 15 minute mark of Wednesday's episode, Budden explains that the Rory and Ma are taking time out of, for themselves while they work out their prospective grievances. Joe was careful not to dive too deep into the root of the problems, but he did fire back at fans from assuming that the interim co-hosts Ice and Savan were there to replace Rory and Ma and for creating a harmful narrative. He said, it ain't just a work thing, Joe said at episode 27 mark. So that's my reaction when I see fans try to split up something that's built so carefully over the years. The best thing you can do is what I wish was granted to me when I was going through it is give time, time, give everyone time to chill. But truth be told, I said this as many, I said this in many of Joe's verses, none of us are slaves to the audience. No one owes anybody anything, which I kind of disagree. You do owe the fans a lot, but again, this is Joe we're talking about. And he has a very open sense over inflated sense of self which is a little bit more grating to kind of endure when he hasn't got his two co-hosts next to him i realized i think that's part of the thing that a lot of people are starting to see as great entertainment as he is shouting and screaming into the microphone it's only good when you've got his actual friends next to him who can kind of you know wait you kind of off balance it out a little bit right so it's just not him just ranting about stuff that doesn't really make any sense and to be honest listening to the show itself i dipped after about an hour he was talking in circles right talking in riddles he didn't really know where it was actually going at and considering how you know picky and nosy and detailed they get in other people's business dealing it was a little bit annoying that they didn't just come out and just say what the issue was but hey we have to just you know um go with what they say it continues here a deputy continues park touches on the difficulties of handling a friendship and business relationship he explains that he and joe don't communicate directly about business matters for the sake of their friendship and future projects which is definitely a good thing to do he says i've been doing business with joe Biden for a very long time he added i don't come to you with business shit because we have to keep that we have to keep doing shit other people should be doing um other people other people should probably have somebody else talk to you or one of, of your professionals which kind of irks on the side of what people are suggesting that supposedly um rory and joe obviously have had a bit of tension on the show joe uh, approached rory about it they had some sort of agreement that rory should take time out of the show and take a seat out or sit down for a bit mal heard that and was like he didn't like the fact that joe told him to do that because they're meant to be partners so they should decide as to as a trio that then led to mal deciding he would stand with rory in his discussion something along those kind of lines but if this if that is to, to believe i think this lends a lot more credence to it because park is basically saying hey look i never talked to you about business because i know how you are and you're just gonna make me angry i want to want to i'm gonna want to punch you in the face um which makes sense it continues here although it was assumed that the tension stems from the business dealings parks was quick to clarify that it isn't quite the case and joe also interjected to reaffirm that the three don't have any beef he said it's not beef but then said when speaking about rory mo said nobody has communicated the beef what they have communicated to me is something is wrong whether it be our friendship or how we are speaking to each other the respect level instead of focusing on the catalyst of the friction joe likened the situation to a start player holding out for a training camp uh, the otas must continue with 11 man on the field but once a star player returns things go back to normal as a result by the button makes it clear that jvp will always be home of rory ma if they want to come back it says i'll eliminate some of the suspense this is rory's seat this is Mal's seat whenever they feel like coming back to their seats then they'll return to their seats um and then uh and then what will happen the same thing that always happens with star player come back in the team so yeah man it's a mad one isn't it it's an absolute mad one um what do i think is happening what do i think is happening take wise i guess take wise i would say it's probably done um this is just a standard sort of pattern and theme that runs through joe Biden's career he always ends up kind of you know um self-imploding and you know basically fucking up his own situations through his own you know 
I don't know, lack, lack of tact or whatever it may be. People are saying that he knows how to fumble the business bag. Who knows? We're not really there. We can only speculate, but I would assume that the show's probably done in this regard. Um, Rory's been intimating at the fact that he doesn't really love podcasting that way. Mo's obviously been getting irritated at a few things here and there in terms of episodes. The magic is probably done, and that might have to do a lot with the fact that that deal from Spotify that they originally turned down is looking mighty good in a post or in a, you know, in a pre post whatever it is uh pandemic world that we're living in at the moment um and i really never understood why 30 million from spotify even if they were asking for your intellectual property and even if they were asking for the rights for the entirety of what joe was doing wasn't a good deal to take in their interim right or just as a kind of um thank you gift to the people that were you know built this entire thing with you and works and what kind of uh and worked long hours to make it happen i don't necessarily see why that was a bad thing because imagine if they would have just took the 30 million and joe would have been like hey i can make all my friends millionaires because i'm one already but they haven't experienced that yet so let me make my friends millionaires even though i know the deal isn't good and then we can just you know do it again another time right or i can go and do another thing and come up with another idea if you're such a genius why don't i make another idea right i could just give them this network give them the ip for this stuff and then do something else later on down the line but this kind of um thing that he has and a lot of people have where they're really hell-bent on making sure that they own everything even in the beginning even when they don't probably have a lot of i won't say rep but maybe a lot of sort of um contacts and bridges haven't been built because i think i would imagine a lot of business especially in entertainment because it's so shoddy and it's so slimy and there's a lot of scams involved i would assume a lot of it is just kind of maybe purposely taking the bad deal knowing you're taking a bad deal just so you can get in certain rooms just so you can have the experience just so you can have the contact i'd imagine a lot of it is because we all know what the bad deals are but unfortunately most of the people making the bad deals are the ones that are also making the good deals so you kind of have to work with them anyway right you're going to have to meet them somewhere along the line so if you sort of burn that bridge it might hamper other bags that you eventually have to get to anyway because the patreon thing let's be honest it's not that amazing right um they cut they jumped on it probably a few few years too late they're probably still making a good amount of money from it but in terms of what they could have done um in terms of the money they could have earned is um is in terms of like lump sums straight away it probably would have made more sense to just sign the spotify deal get the 30 million break that off with your friends and then whatever happens in the future happens in the future you just kind of deal with it as it goes by and if it means that you have to kind of leave the show and make your own thing and maybe whatever it may be um then fair play but at the moment considering what's happened considering the way joe is you know he's a grown dude he's what is he nearly 40 maybe over 40 regardless of what it is the kind of attitude that he has it's very unlikely that he changes and things go back to how they were previously i just think it's just gone too far now at the moment and it's probably going to be the end of it for what it is isn't it but i guess you know we had a good run we enjoyed it i think i enjoyed it for the most part it brought me a lot of laughs um a lot of great interviews you know the pushy t drake thing was flipping incredible um loads of good industry stuff that you would probably be aware of many great suggestions and tips on you know um the sleepers they do at the end and just loads of great laughs in it really that that was what it was you always felt like you were in the room with them so you know we cherish that for what it is but in terms of it returning to how it was prior it does seem like that boat is probably sailed for now and you know that is probably the nature of the game and it things sometimes do end like that things sometimes do end like that okay what else do we have here is this working it is right it is i'm pretty sure it is it should be what we have here yeah this is from the bbc man this is sad isn't it right uh, covid marks one year since the first lockdown from the bbc madness isn't it so it's from bbc it says the uk is marking one year since the first lockdown virus uh, happened with the queen reflecting on the grief and loss felt by so many a national minute silence has held at midday which parliaments um which parliaments across the uk paused business to observe on 23rd of march 2020 prime minister boris johnson announced tough restrictions to people's lives since then the uk national death toll has risen um, from 364 to 100 and 200, 160,172, which is still a lot lower than I would assume it would have been if you didn't have a vaccine. So, Jesus Christ, just imagine what the numbers would have been like. 
you know, we reacted slow, divvied around a lot, and still the numbers are like that. Imagine if that didn't happen. Imagine if that didn't, yeah, imagine that didn't happen. You probably, I don't know, who knows. Mr. Johnson, who observed the silence privately, praised the great spirit shown since the first lockdown and offered his condolences for those who have been bereaved during the pandemic. He told Downing Street Briefing Room um, that at the right moment, a permanent memorial to those who died from corona will be built and said the whole period will be commemorated the president's prime minister said that the nation was step by step jab by jab on the path to reclaiming our freedoms and the government held on target to meet the vaccination goal he thanked people for their patience and praised the heroes of the nhs and social work and social care as well as the shop and transport workers and the police as of monday more than 28.3 million people have received the first vaccine dose da, 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 da. it comes further 200 deaths but yeah man madness isn't it one year on one year on it doesn't it feels like time has basically flown in that regard isn't it um things aren't really things are looking up in some regard but not in others so we just take each step as it goes. Um, time around it happened. March 16th, 18th, 20th, 23rd. Boom, 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 boom. It just hit us all at once in it. But at least we have some way to go back. Let's move on from that one. Oh, yeah, this is funny, isn't it, right? So this is an article here from the BBC. It says, um, P&O cruises say travellers will need vaccinations to get back on board, right? And I've, I, I've tried to do a bit of a deep dive on this and find out exactly what the appeal of these flipping long-haul cruises is because I watched this documentary the other day. Um, what was this one? It was this. Uh, it's called Deadly Trip of a Lifetime on a COVID-19 Cruise. It's on CBSBS Dateline, Australian TV program, I think. Um, pretty good um, documentary that focuses on a... Uh, it, says it started out as an industry... It started out as a holiday of a lifetime and quickly turned into a ship in lockdown searching for the port in COVID storm. Dateline charts a story of MV Greg Mortimer cruise ship that left Argentina four days after coronavirus was declared a pandemic now the funny thing about this story is that um i think covid was just spreading when it was happening and um this cruise was going i guess around the antarctica near argentina leaving argentina to go near near the antarctic and it was a, a an antarctic basic cruise you'd basically put, go off you take pictures hang out with penguins you know the whole shebang the whole white people shebang thing and for some reason they still decided to go through with it prior to covid you know uh spreading like wildfire and there was obviously an inherent danger and what you kind of see throughout the documentary which has kind of been echoed throughout the entire world was that the privileged few the ones that actually bought the tickets the ones that were from you know uh parts of western europe western the western hemisphere whatever it may be europeans were able to go on the cruise they were basically you know doted over by mostly you know people that will come from third world countries you know latin uh latinas latin americans south american or latinas whatever you, you turn them to be people from mexico and parts of south america were basically the people that were in charge of cleaning the rooms making the food all that sort of stuff in terms of maintenance and then when the virus did end up spreading across the entire ship it was the people um who were th at the lowest rungs of it that kind of paid the greatest price and the ones that were buying the tickets got to basically you know got escorted off the, the off the boat on flipping ambulances even though they put themselves at risk they're the ones that put themselves at risk and they're the ones that ended up surviving this utterly horrendous ordeal and um it just got me thinking in terms of people that want to go on cruises voluntarily um it's a weird thing it makes sense i think at a certain age because like i said you know, it's all inclusive you don't need to go anywhere really um you get weighted on hand and foot um sometimes depending on your route it's an interesting location to go to but there's also this weird idea or weird thing that people are doing now where whenever there's a suggestion that things are going to change in terms of how you interact with the world when it comes to covid right the covid passports and stuff when it comes to certain things people are very resistant to it but i'm just curious as to the people that were offended or took umbrage with the fact that you might have to have some sort of vaccination or to get on a cruise what did you think was going to happen did you think they were going to let you back on a boat with hundreds of other old people who are all at risk 
just on the whim and just putting your mask on and stuff people can't be trusted um, we've seen what's happening with supermarkets look what's happening in supermarkets people can't be trusted to put on a mask for five minutes to get a couple of avocados right um for the weekend let alone sit in a cruise drinking and what and whatnot and doing the shot and shuffle whatever flipping old people doing a boat so um, it, 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 imagine imagine now in a post-covid world it doesn't make any sense so um pno obviously saying if you want to get back on a cruise you're going to have to get a vaccine and this is a report here from abc i'm going to play for you to get it up on the screen detailing everything here Morning to you. Yeah, listen, the cruise industry has been shut down for over a year now after those COVID outbreaks. But starting in June, that's about to change just as travel bookings are soaring. This morning, new hope for travelers who want scenes like these to come back. Royal Caribbean and Celebrity Cruises with the big news, both announcing they plan to start sailing again in June, but not from the U.S. Royal Caribbean from the Bahamas, Celebrity from St. Martin, with bookings opening up this week. Celebrity CEO Lisa Lutoff Perlow speaking with me over the weekend. And in your case, every single passenger and crew member must be vaccinated? Every guest and our crew must be vaccinated if they're 18 or older. And for children, they will be required to have a negative PCR test within 72 hours of their cruise as well. They are still working out the exact COVID protocols for June, but expect enhanced cleaning procedures and redesigned air filtration. The but this should be expected, right? Again, I, I, I'm shocked at the demand because supposedly the demand is sky high and people are like falling over themselves to get tickets to go to these sort of things. But that should just be a standard, isn't it, right? That you should get a vaccine to get on a boat. I just can't understand why there's any pushback towards it. So it says here on the BBC, p and Cruises says travellers will need vaccinations. Um, it says your travellers will have to prove that they have had two coronavirus jabs in order to take the trips. You have to have two even. You can't only have one. Um, da 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 it comes amid new, renewed fears about the damaged travel industry with airports warning that summer 2020 num passenger numbers were the lowest since 1975. P&O Cruises, which is part of the Carnival Group, will run trips on two ships this summer. The Britannia will cruise from Southampton along the southwest coast, south, uh, south coast of England for three or four days and the Iona will travel up to Scotland from Southampton for seven day trips. Carnival said the passengers wishing to board would have to have both vaccination jabs at least a week before departure. Madness. Guests will also have to have a travel insurance that must include medical reparations cover and medical expenses. So obviously they want nothing to do with you if you fall sick and happen to foam at the mouth because you ate too many prawns or because you contacted the deadly virus. Um, the guests and crew will be expected to respect social distancing rules and wear masks when appropriate um and should anyone test positive on board they'll be isolated and quarantined paul ludlow the president of the piano cruises said the carnival expected the government approved way to prove people had been vaccinated by the summer it said it's moving at pace we anticipate by 27th of june which is our first sailing there will be a government accredited scheme to prove a vaccination by the very least then of course a letter from the gp will be suffice okay so i guess they're that's what people are talking about in terms of the passport quote unquote it'll be like an app or something i guess that'll be linked to your nhs number or something along those kind of lines so once you've been approved and you've been jabbed up to a necessary dosage you'll get some sort of sign or some sort of badge on your thing that'll prove yeah hey I'm, i've got the thing done there now because it's all digital or i would imagine it's going to be digital for the time being in terms of logistics is there a scenario that you see where people will fake um, the fact that they've got a vaccine on their COVID quote unquote iPhone passport app thing. Will that be a new form of business? Will that be a dark net, dark web um, source of revenue for some people out there? Um, I could see it happening for sure, especially if vaccinations tend up drying up or people can't get slots or they just don't want to get them in general and they want to live off the grid, but you kind of pretend you got the jab, um, run a little scam. You're obviously putting people at risk. It's very, very, um, I probably wouldn't encourage it, but I could definitely see that happening. So they're probably going to have to do something to safeguard with that, right? Some sort of way. I'm not sure what the method is. Maybe it's something that gets attached to your passport. I don't know, but something needs to be done that maybe could li uh, limit the scope of people exploiting that. He said, um, that, 
He said that Pino Cruz's was in close conversation with the government every day about travellers being able to prove their vaccination status. At the moment, we're stipulating that all guests and all ages must be vaccinated to come on board. A spokesperson for the Department of Transport said the leading efforts to develop a framework that will safely facilitate international travel when the time is right, while still managing the risk from imported cases and variants. Carnival follows Saga Cruz, which said in January that all customers had to be vaccinated. British Airways also said it's, it also plans to let people register when they had two vaccinations on a smartphone oh that's an interesting one isn't it that's a very interesting development so british airways are, tr are basically letting you tell them if you want that you got the vaccine interesting i would imagine a lot of these especially the budget airlines because they just can't afford any you know um downtime when they get things back up and running they'll probably require you to have some sort of vaccine especially if you're heading into some of the hot spots in europe or neighboring hot spots you don't want to put anyone at risk so you'd probably be like you know what just to cover our bases because we're already losing money by charging you 40 quid to get to bloody andalusia let's just make sure you get your vaccine done show us proof of it and then you can board i'd imagine kind of us not yet run cruises for a year due to coronavirus but i don't know man i wonder what i wonder i wonder but that's big news there in terms of cruises let's see what occurs as we continue Du, 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 du. moving on there what else do we have here oh it's just courtesy of mix mag <laughs> it's hilarious coachella has somehow managed to postpone their festivals for a third time now how do they always get to do this is this like a i'm i'm suspecting this is more so a, a tax scam or some sort of hustle where if you kind of um say you're postponed it means you're not liable to pay certain monies or not i, I think so because this doesn't make any sense it's clearly they weren't going to be on this year why do they keep like postponing it just say it's not on and just redo it another year this postponement thing is very strange um it says here for mixed micro is reportedly rescheduling from october 21st october 2021 to april 2022 which is the original dates usually according to a report from variety which is basically the, the pr um unit of coachella it says yeah source cited two industry sources with knowledge of the situation the festival's promoter golden voice and its parent company aeg presents did not respond to requests of comment the reasons given is ongoing certainty with um, uh, with the plausibility of throwing large scale events this year due to pandemic Coachella attracts 125,000 people that's mad in it um, over the course of each day from all over the world making it right for potential disease transmission to spread that's true because you that's what you forget as great as it is for people living in North America there is a big international audience that goes there too because the lineups are insane um, so they don't want to you know be at risk of inviting people from abroad coming over and then spiking up the cases so they suspected that Coachella's country music sister event stagecoach festival will move as well if the report is accurate this will mark the fourth fourth rescheduling a festival that has not taken place since it rescheduled in april 2020 um the event wasn't able to go ahead due to the pandemic at the time it initially rescheduled for october yeah that was a funny bit you remember they tried to reschedule it for later in the year they thought they could get away with it like these people went before officially cancelling its 2020 edition altogether and then planned a 2021 edition was reportedly postponed to 2022 2021 again so they've done it every single year um other festivals in the u.s are still expecting to go ahead and move forward their plans there's a big difference between having two weekends at coachella and california and throwing a country festival in florida one source said so yeah um not really surprising news i think most people with a brain would have assumed that this wasn't going to happen um but again i guess you know if you were waiting with bated breath to go to coachella this year then it's going to be next year at the earliest um i would probably say don't even hold your breath for next year good things what well, actually do hold your breath america's usually you know they're not really giving a shit about covid they're doing it the way they want to do it so there's probably scope for you to go and do that going forward next year we have a new open air club is opening in manchester square one will open on june 26 which is great to see i think even though with the pandemic loads of places have ended up closing down and we've lost we've lost a lot of night spots we've lost a lot of record stores and venues in general we've lost a lot and i'm pretty sure when things reopen up again it's going to be really sobering to see all the places that we know and love prior that have gone forever it's also given opportunity for people to get a little bit unconventional because i'd assume the first couple of weeks or maybe the first month or so after everything's reopened from june 21st onwards it's going to be a bit of a 
it's going to be a bit of a free for all. Um, the you know the the rules are going to be loosened somewhat. People are going to be able to put on more things outdoors, and maybe not so many limits on sound, all that kind of stuff. So it's going to give people an opportunity to get a bit creative with the spaces that they you know set up and open and whatnot. And this looks something similar because we don't really have a lot of these sort of open airy type things in the UK, which makes sense considering the weather's always shit. But I still think there's a scope to be a little bit more ingen ingenious, ingenuitive, or whatever, ingenuitive, whatever that word is, when it comes to opening up clubs and setting them up. So this is a thing here from Mixmag. It looks pretty sick, isn't it, right? Like this amazing little arch thing with the massive screen on it, with obviously the uh, standard containers. There's going to be this. Is it. Um, Manchester's getting a new club, open air space called Square One. The venue will be open from June 26th at a site near Piccadilly Station, which is right outside the station. And its opening party will feature Dennis Salter, Enzo Siragusa, and Hot Since 82. You know the deal. Tech House, Tech House, Tech House to the day we die. Tech House and Disco. So you know what crowd you're going to get when you go there, but I, I wouldn't mind going still. Square One builds itself as an open air clubbing destination and the summer calendar boasts parties from the Zootech, Jika Jika, Animal Crossing, and Amsterdam Bay label piv parties will run from 2 p.m until 11 p.m which is awesome a statement from the venue reads manchester is our home this is one of the dancers a new venue with no nonsense let's make up the lost memories and come together a good and proper open air affair summer is coming and the dance floor is ready sick in it right i really i'm a big fan of what it looks like so let's check out the instagram Let's see what they've got up there in terms of visuals of the place. Not so much, nothing yet. They've got obviously, you know, a little bit of uh, information on who's going to play. Um, I would hope the lineup would be a little bit. Oh, look, there's a little bit of an idea of what it looks like over. So it's just near the station, which it makes good, which makes a lot of gives me a lot of hope in terms of sound limits right um, next to a motorway there's probably not a lot of limits that way because that was same thing that happens to junction 2 festival here in london it's sick because it's legitimately underneath a, in underneath junction um, in terms of a bridge that goes over on the motorway so they're able to really crank up the volume um, and maybe get a bit creative of how they use the space so that'd be pretty sick and i'm just hoping they also just tap into a local community in it like book some people that are local and well known in that scene over there and just basically give them a platform to reach a wider and bigger audience no real need to go out there and book massive people to come and play these sort of events especially if it's sort of, sort of like a temporary space that's sort of just done in part with a community thing kind of Thing. I don't know whatever they got to deal with it doesn't make no sense to go out and get all the bait people that play a circle local and stuff it's better just to kind of tap into a local scene so hopefully that gets done but yeah it does look pretty sick to be fair I'm a big fan of it should be a good should be a good vibe um everyone doing their thing and getting down in the summer that is square one in Manchester opening I think no tickets already sold out opening Jesus right it looks like opening schedule tickets sold out deals the next show coming soon pre register below mad mate all sold out already anyway so check it out but yeah sold out for now what else do we have here oh yeah this is a big one isn't it this is a big one in terms of direction maybe gives us some hope going forward so this is courtesy of Mix Mag Prince Works announces a mammoth reopening weekend the London Club will reopen in September um I still never actually been I'm pretty sure if I'm not mistaken yeah, I've not gone. I've not actually been in, inside it. Actually, I've been around it, but I've not been inside the place. Um, they usually have pretty decent lineups. Um, the only thing that puts me off, as per usual, is the crowd. You know, London is always like that. The venues are not too bad. The lineups are always pretty sick, but it's usually the crowd that goes to the particular lineup that you want to avoid. Um, but with it being post-COVID, I think everyone's going to be up for a laugh. It's going to be a little bit less pretentious than it usually is. And it's going to, just going to be a free-for-all. So I think this is probably the best time to go to these kind of places and re-experience them. And I'm sure they've probably done some improvements, you know, changed things around a bit. It's just going to be a nice to sort of experience it anew, again, with open and fresh eyes. So the article says the following. Prima has announced a mammoth reopening weekend. The London Club is going to go back to basics, quote unquote, for free opening parties on September 17th, 18th and 19th. So they're basically holding off right towards the end of the year. I wonder why they're not kind of doing stuff straight out of the gate in July. But hey, um, the parties have been announced around the concept of Redacted, which will be a pure celebration of club culture where, with no lineups announced in advance and a rule of no social media, no cameras and no distractions. Oh, I love that. Right. Um, it's funny because this venue is obviously heavily dependent on the lineups right the lamps are super 
uh, stacked usually and very diverse. They cover everything from drum and bass to dubstep to EDM to tech, you know, whatever, right? They really do well in terms of who they book and who they allow to use that space, blah, 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 blah. So that does really well. So for them to go for this sort of, uh, you know, approach, even though I still know for the most part, I'd imagine it's still going to be the, all the big names, but the fact that they're not, publicizing it and making it into a thing of like hey let's just kind of you know we spent all enough time in front of the computer watching streams on our phone all day for this one occasion when we're actually going to be back in this club let's probably just put all those things to the side and just enjoy the space that we're in now i'm sure it's not going to last long because there's been a few places in london that have tried to do the whole bird guy no pictures no cameras thing it just doesn't work right as you know i guess brits we just don't you know we want to we want to remember the shit that we're doing because we're too shit faced because we get too fucked up too early so there's no real scope for being able to tell people not to take pictures and record stuff they're just going to do it anyway so that's probably not going to work long term but it's still commendable that they're doing it and it definitely is going to add a different i would imagine it's going to add a different sort of vibe and ambiance to the spot when you're in there um it continues previous promises free carefully curated events featuring the world's venues um featuring the venue's favorite artists and its usual top tier audiovisual production um and then get here from the site itself they got a great little graphic there showing it redacted redacted I think they will sold that as well, which is even great, right? Which is, makes it, maybe it's another indication of just how the appetite of people going out and maybe it's a changing overall in terms of the approach because that'll be good to see because this will definitely um, signal the return um, or the reintroduction of resident DJs, which I've been pushing for a lot because obviously it'll favor me, right? Myself being a kind of, you know, a, a DJ on the up and coming, on the up and up, up and coming, whatever that is, whatever that means to be said there's more scope or more opportunity for me to get involved to play at these kind of places if they do have a resident dj program because that allows people to basically get some training um you know learn how to cultivate a crowd learn how to keep people on the dance floor how to read a room uh, maybe allow you to basically play in front of a you know a ready-made audience that don't really know you uh, boost your boost your basically fan base what you know improve your ability to dig and to craft a set bloody blah 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 and it's something that's been a staple usually in continental europe in places there's always had people that they've kind of counted on as residents um but for some reason in the uk it's not really a thing maybe because of licensing laws places don't stay open enough long enough to basically allow the bar managers and the event bookers an opportunity to test things out like that they need to just guarantee that they can get tickets and get people to spend money at the bar so you're just going to go books fan bar to play because you know he's going to sell a certain amount ricardo Villalobos, you know all these kind of people so i get it but in terms of the health of the overall scene it's kind of suffered right because now we have a real separation we have all the big events and then we have all the events that are just done on the kind of underground local scale and there's no rule in between that's the issue right you go from playing in warehouses with 200 people and then suddenly you're playing in flipping print works with a thousand there's nothing in between in terms of level in terms of area in terms of fan but it's just a bit strange in that regard but if they if print works do something like this going forward again i don't expect them to do this forever but if they have certain nights maybe like a thursday a sunday wherever that they just dedicate to a redacted night that'll be sick i think that'd be sick but yeah so far we've got 17th 18th and 19th um saturday and sunday are already sold out was it friday saturday whatever those two days are sold out already um says here for a long time for a long overdue return to the dance we're stripping it back to basics the uh, uh, pain secondly created over the lockdown months artists agents have go joined together in a supporting our vision to delivering free distinct uh, uh, distraction free shows with each event celebrating a different element of the dance music spectrum artists for each show will be revealed at the event we are implementing a no photos on the dance floor policy at each show the pre-sale tickets da, 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 da. but yeah sick in it man I, i'm i'm a big fan of it i, I like this approach hopefully it is received well because that's the whole the only thing with these sort of things if people like us don't receive them well we don't buy tickets we don't go then it just tells the you know the owners and the bookers and whatever it may be that this is not what we want and then they just go back to what they know that works already so if we do want a more interesting nights out and we do want to see our friends that are toiling away producing in their room and playing in underground raves to play these sort of big platforms we need to support these sort of things and then hopefully vote with our feet vote with our wallet and then we see that stuff be repeated over and over again in the future because that'll be sick that would be sick 
let's move on let's move on we're not going to talk about that what time are we at we got that one um bu, 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 bu. let's move on from let's do this yeah let's do that one hold on let me get this what's i got here Ba, 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 ba. Oh yeah, this let's do this, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this, yeah. Let's do this. So um it was interesting to see the other day that business techno or business techno, the Twitter account, uh an Instagram account that has essentially been at the forefront in terms of calling out all of the playgrades that are occurring in London and all over the place. Um they decided to basically quit it sounds like it sounds like they've quit it sounds like they decided to hang up their microphone or hang up their uh, their headphones uh put away their sleeves or their vinyl and trudge back into the wilderness because people just simply don't care it feels like about what's going on um i've kind of fallen in that camp recently i've kind of stopped really caring about who's throwing the playgrounds and who's playing i think especially due to the you know m the epic mishandling of covid and the lockdown and vaccinations and stuff like people just need to let their hair down and have a bit of a boogie the people that are playing need to be able to put food in their table and keep a roof over their head and i just don't think i'm in any position to tell people how they should go about making money right i just don't think that should be my uh position i also don't think i should be in any position to tell people what they should and shouldn't be doing especially when you don't have any light at the end of the tunnel to tell you how you will or when you will get back to doing that thing you're being you know you're essentially having to ask permission from the government to allow you to go back outdoors and live your life which is not something that i kind of vibe with whatsoever especially considering what we know about the virus now when it was last when it was this time last year fair enough everyone was scared you know what's going on but considering the developers and the developments that we have now with the vaccine and the way things are going in certain sectors it just seems like to keeping ourselves permanently locked down forever until everyone's vaccinated isn't the best way to go about things there needs to be some sort of middle ground in this respect that's not happening so of course people are going to freak out and they're just going to do what they want to do just to kind of let their hair down and enjoy themselves and that's what we're basically seeing covid now of course the exploitive nature of it the fact that people are leaving you know fairly stable economies and countries and heading over to third world countries to go play because the rules aren't as strict does leave a bad taste in the mouth i have to be completely honest but again we how are we going to go around policing um what the other governments you know around the world do to me it sounds a little bit similar to what the things that people are fighting against about you know uh, british imperialism imperialism sorry imperialism imperialism british imperialism right going abroad to other countries and basically telling them how to run their countries same with what america do in various places across the middle east um and this is what we're kind of doing on the internet right telling these countries that have some very complex politics that we're not very familiar with because we're obviously over here and tell them how to police and do whatever they're going to do it just doesn't make any sense to me long term it's not very productive overall and again people just don't give a shit so if that's the case that's the case but i think um business session have sort of felt it and they kind of felt like they're shouting into the void and they put out this statement this communicado official which is jokes because this is something that you'd see usually um football clubs implementing when they're announcing a transfer or the sacking of a manager so it's quite hilarious that they're taking this approach to it but um again it's interesting considering how everything's changed in the last year or so if this was this wouldn't have happened in september because everyone was like frothing at the mouth to point out people that were playing in places te uh being a whole monitor and tell telling and everyone in it but now things have changed and everyone's kind of feeling a little bit worried and nervous about getting back on the dance or worried and nervous about when they will get back on the dance floor and also annoyed at how their countries have dealt with things people are a little bit more forgiving as to who's going and also you have to be completely honest the people that are playing these playgrounds now aren't the big glitzy business techno people anymore it's your regular people it's your people in the middle tiers right people in the maybe the upper lower tiers who are now playing these events because guess what they don't have any coins mate um you know i'm sure in certain countries marking yourself down as a freelance dj doesn't necessarily guarantee you any um support from the government or no support that's actually going to make any meaningful change so in order to keep a roof over their heads and make ensure they have the ability to return to djing when things open up again they're having to take 
make these very sketchy deals playing in places like Tanzania, Ukraine and parts of Mexico, Colombia and shit. And it's just, you know, it is what it is. So it continues here. This is from Business Techno um business tesh no official twitter page communicado official press he says we've started to cover the playgraves in august 2020 despite many journalists following our coverage they stay silent silent until the moment dave clark addressed the playgraves from then on they no longer were needed to come forward at themselves but could hide behind the title such as dave clark calls at playgraves since then the major platforms have avoided criticizing the industry leaders involved we've done our research and have written articles often criticized but always backed up with statistics we expected that the open letter would get a refraction of attention would not get a fraction of it uh, what is it Let's repeat that again we expected that the open letter would not get a fraction of attention funny memes get resident advisor mix mag dj mag ignored it completely was it tone or is it because they do not care at all for the black lives at stake despite their pledge last year it's not necessarily a black lives thing i think the whole black lives matter situation after the george the un untimely passing of george floyd was a bit performative again I don't see what some, um, I don't see what that, I don't see how that situation had anything to do with dance music. It was very odd that that sort of kind of got conflated, but I guess it was a conversation about representation, about whatever else could be, but it was a little bit odd, but fair enough. They tried to do something there. It didn't really work. And in general, people just don't give a shit. I think this is what we've basically seen. Everyone that put up little black squares on their profile page when George Floyd died. Let's go back to those people when, ask them what they've done for the quote-unquote black community they've not done jack shit because they don't really give a shit it was performative it touched everyone's heartstrings at the time and they even decided to do it the fact of mixed mag and resident advisor not covering the playgrounds is not surprising too as i mentioned in a few other shows prior um most of the big people that are playing these playgrounds are all under the same i'm gonna say booking agency i forgot what it was whatever the one that peggy goose signed to there's loads of other big djs that are on there that all played playgrounds so um these same people are also the ones that play their streaming events for whatever platform it is mixed mag or dj mag or resident advisor they're also the same people who are married and kind of connected up with certain sponsors so they would never ever going to call out the very same people who end up paying their wages it wasn't going to happen um that was always off the table so it was interesting i was observing from the outside in to see if they would then call out the people who are a bit unattached the ones that are signed maybe to independent booking agencies and stuff would they would say anything and they didn't um, admirably enough right they just kind of decided to play neutral and kind of you know cover their eyes and ears as it was going on in the same way that when the peggy Goo and daniel wang situation was going on no real major electronic dance music you know platform covered it in that regard too because they're in bed with their certain sponsors and management and representation it doesn't make any sense for them to get involved so it continues our work is based on a simple idea helping music journalists by offering the facts about the much care topics so they can easily write about them this is this is a little bit um what you call it what's that word called this is a little bit um this is a little bit self-absorbed isn't it we're here to give you information it's like all right jog on a little bit you're, you're just uploading pictures of people partying to me um relax so it continues here um the biggest demographic following us are non-poc journalists uh, many of them used to work used our work to write their stories thereby making some money this is all right if we are credited <laughs> bruv whoever runs this page is a fucking weapon um over time we came to realize however that no matter how much work we put into this project selflessly put in this project the big platforms just don't care and will stay silent when their favorite djs are out there in the center controversy for them facts don't seem to matter at all without the help of our great community who actually cares about the black lives at stake our recent open letter would have gotten the same attention um it would have uh, disappeared amongst the internet noise we can't blame anyone except those in the industry who are aware of this going on they know the people behind the playgraves as well as their motives the decisions to back them up uh, it's conspicuous no, it's a conscious one while some people outside the industry can be excused for their silence due to lack of information many people don't know the inner workings of techno industry and have no idea how much money is actually being made so they're likely excused as certain people's behavior you know what most people don't know and they don't care and they shouldn't care i think i can't actually wait until things reopen so i don't have to care about stuff like this it doesn't really concern most people i think i only discovered business techno or this fucking phrase or techno twitter in the first place because i decided to spend more time on twitter during this lockdown 
most of the time I was outdoors, partying, putting on raves, DJing myself, you know, doing stuff. So it kind of avoids you having to listen to all this noise because at the end of the day, most of the stuff I've said previously could be addressed and could be sorted out by people actually putting their money where their mouth is and actually putting on their own events backing themselves and kind of trying to be a part of the process to fix things as opposed to just sitting there pointing fingers that doesn't necessarily work because if you try and call these people out and try and shame them they don't respond if you try and you know uh, if you try and kind of appeal to their better to their charity or better nature they don't respond either they clearly don't give a shit they're living their lives doing whatever they want to do uh playing the same festivals and same places same lineups running up the same bills polluting the oceans you know flying private everywhere they go but then picking up flipping you know uh debris and litter on the flipping beach and hissing at the camera nonsense right they're all a nonsense hypocrites and you know annoying people but it is what it is i think you need to be able to carve a whole different scene away from those guys it doesn't really involve them and do it or get involved in the industry in the system itself and try and fix it from the outside in but this standing from the outside wagging your finger just doesn't necessarily seem to work so far we've not seen it work it continues <clears throat> When our posts are about racism and white supremacy, we often get completely ignored the scene with the recent uh, by racism post addressing the RNS record situation, or we get angry reactions. These reactions, <laughs> majorly written by white men, are mostly dismissive and gaslighting the victims of racism with comments like he didn't mean it or he'd need to have a debate about how words could be misinterpreted in different languages, which is true. I'll not be honest, though. The gaslighting and the... And the and the, what was that thing called? And the latent racism is obviously there in the scene, but everyone knew this existed prior to. This shouldn't be a shock and surprise. Again, it's about building and creating safe havens for ourselves. And if we can do it, fair enough. If we can't do it, fair enough. But I think this always existed personally i don't think this is a whole, whole huge surprise it says here maybe it's just doing it completely wrong do facts not matter if one favorite teacher is involved are the people right when they accuse us of cop behavior yep you're definitely cops definitely the feds it says here are we really the council account that tries to put these very fine people who have no other intentions than sharing good vibes out of business with a single pose obviously not um should we give these people more years to understand how they harm black lives i don't understand the black lives thing what's harming is it harming black lives because they're not booking somebody that you know that's black is that harming this is an insane statement i get what they mean i get the gist of it right it is cop behavior to be telling people how they should go about you know supporting themselves during a global pandemic it's also hilarious that during this entire pandemic the only people that have been performing and you know making sure they go and tour and not listening to any sort of the mandates and skirting the rules have been stand-up comedians and djs for some reason these two occupations think that they have uh, a divine right to go and earn money outdoors more so than any other person i don't think bands when's the last band you've gone to see bands haven't performed in yonks right in ages but djs and stand-ups have had you know carte blanche in terms of performing in front of a live audience cool fair enough but people go to these things people put them on knowing what the risks are it just is what it is what do you want do you want us to go and round people up with with the police in tow that's super cop behavior that's narc behavior to the extreme do you want people to be locked inside their rooms by force like what is the solution here above this i mean what is it do you want us to go and invade another country and tell them how to um you know how to uh, treat their citizens and how to treat people that are coming into their country what do you want us to do that's what i'm asking and the black lives thing is always odd it's a really odd point of view to take with it i, I get rep representation is one thing but inserting black lives into this it's just odd like why uh let's continue as blau and commented that was an epic in it blau man one absolute weapon remember that <laughs> blau and commented early this year after his fans criticized him for playing a player he says i will not apologize i'm not sorry the party was absolute fucking fire you know nothing of my circumstances <laughs> so much to put it in the t-shirt bruv that was an amazing statement in it and i think he posted the picture of an airplane pointing downwards like it was kind of you know careering into the ground or something uh it's flipping insane guy he says yeah so maybe we should just close this project and move on because none of these big platforms will hold any of these ddjs accountable and obviously none of them will speak honestly about their circumstances thank you for the 400 people who cared enough to share our open letter thank you for the few people in that left industry who shared it knowing that some peers would like to see side 
thing with us. These platforms don't care about black people. I don't know. Do they? Do they care about anybody? Probably not. If you're not bringing in money, they don't give a shit about you. That probably goes to say that could probably goes for every single platform. But then the funny thing is, off the back of that, Resident Advisor finally posted an article talking about the raves that are ravaging uh, parts of Tulum in Mexico. Tulum parties rage on as Mexico's COVID nineteen death rate jumps to third in the world, and they're attributing it a lot to foreigners going over to Tulum and putting on raves and shit. You know these shitty tech house parties that they put on where everyone wears big hats and deep v neck t shirts. So there is finally some acknowledgement that this actually is happening. I'm not too sure why it took so long for Resident Advisor to post something like this. They've even got some videos of certain DJs playing here. Um, they've got Sol Solado sound and Father and Son playing out there. Another clip here shows up some other people playing. So there's obviously an acknowledgement that this issue is happening and it's obviously affecting some people, but overall no one really gives a shit and i guess that's just the way that we're at we're at in terms of the scene um i think when things reopen people will be in for a very rude awakening i think all this posturing and you know uh, talking in general online about diversifying lineups and having representation it's all going to fall on deaf ears everyone's just going to go back to doing exactly what they did prior i think we're probably going to see a lot more of these redacted sealed you know private groups no redacted um lineups and things in an effort to kind of hide the fact that all that representation talk they did prior is bullshit all the black squares they put up was really you know again uh, another performative thing that was just empty um and we're gonna see it when things reopen up again you're gonna see all the same people playing at all the same events no real change and it would just be exactly you know as regular scheduled programming and i think there's actually an example here of it um this is a what is it called riverside riverside festival in glasgow right glasgow happens to be in scotland if you're not familiar right and look at the lineup just look at it <clears throat> let's get up here see if you got it, Is it a, oh. get this off the screen yeah look at the look at the lineup look at that lineup look at it <laughs> does that make any sense to you this is in glasgow right so obviously the friday of course right friday and saturday is pretty you know what you'd kind of know for a uk-ish sort of festival or for a festival here on these shores great british festival then look at the sunday amelie lens dax J, back to back with kobolsi ellen allian hector oaks ida paul the temple slam vtss come on like why are all these people from berlin flying over to play a set that you would maybe see in you know greece Müller or something does that make any sense and again it's just the same old faces you see here disclosure even cormac again he's obviously from he, you know, he's from ireland in it right but he lives in over there um it's just the same old faces the same old people playing the same old things nothing really changes all those empty promises fall on deaf ears when the money is involved but yeah that's where we're at man that's where we're at. i think that might be a good place to end it nice and optimistic for the future um <laughs> things don't change man things just always stay the same nothing really changes really in that regard it all just stays unfortunately somewhere near the same so that was the action show episode number 442 thanks so much for tuning in as per usual for the first time check out the show make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe leave me a comment down below if you're first time listening of course and if you're tuning in via the podcast that please leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends until then i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe peace